Hello. I'm Clayton Cheever. I'm the assistant director here at the library, and it is my sincere honor and pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. I love this time of year because it's when everybody loves to come out and talk about how much they love this awesome city. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about today and, and hear about people who are very passionate about working for us uh, here in the city. So I don't have a lot to say. I just wanted to say welcome. I'm very glad that you're all here. I'm very glad all the candidates that you're all here this evening. Thank you for coming. Um, we have a great partnership with March Forward Quincy who has helped cultivate all the questions for this. And to talk a little bit more about what's happening tonight and the questions and March Forward Quincy, I'd like to introduce Edie. Edie, thank you. Side here a little bit just to say greetings, everyone. My name is Edie Edwards, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about March Forward Quincy, a proud co sponsor of this candidate's conversation. I'm also going to do brief introductions of the candidates. So, March Forward Quincy is a progressive grassroots organization that encourages civic engagement in local and national issues by nurturing empathy among members in our community. Since its inception in 2017, our group has tried to educate ourselves and raise awareness within the Quincy community on matters political, so that we as individuals can choose meaningful ways to participate in our government. We do not endorse specific candidates. We have done voter registration drives, hosted topical meetings, shared information about events and issues in our town, state, and country, and learned techniques to make our voices heard within our government. Clearly, all of you here in the audience today care about the city of Quincy, and we want you to take action with your informed vote on November 5th. So let me introduce you to the five candidates vying for the three at-large city councilor seats. Um, so alphabetically, first we have Ann Mahoney. Lifetime Quincy resident Ann Mahoney is the fourth generation of her family to live in her West Quincy home. She is a graduate of the Quincy Public Schools and attended Suffolk University, graduating with a BA in finance. She is currently working full-time as a product segment leader in a financial services institution. She also started Cyclone Design Inc., a graphic design studio located in Boston and later in Quincy Center from 1993 to 2013. Anne served on the school committee for three terms. She is now in her first term as counselor at large and is seeking the election. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right. Frank Rubino has a business education, including a master's degree from Bentley University. He has worked in various financial analyst roles where he tracked and analyzed budgets. Some of his community involvement includes Quincy Community Action Program, the Ward 2 Civic Association, and treasurer of the Quince of Quincy Pride. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Next alphabetically, we have Joanne Sullivan Cantor. Joanne Sullivan Cantor is originally from upstate New York, me too, by the way, um, and is one of the two newcomers to the at-large city councilor race. She moved to Quincy in 2012 and lives in Wallace. <laughs> On to the ends. <laughs> Nina Liang is current two-term at-large city councilor, running for re-election. Born and raised in Quincy, Nina serves on the boards of the Thomas Crane Public Library Foundation and the Massachusetts Asian American Commission. Nina co-founded the Quincy Women's Network and is involved with a number of other community organizations, including Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, Quincy Asian Resources, Inc., Father Bills, the South Shore YMCA, and Quincy Community Action Programs. The final candidate is Noel DeBona. Noel DeBona has served, been serving as Councilor at Large for the last four years and is seeking his third term. Prior to serving on the City Council, Noel was elected to the School Committee and was a Parks and Recreation Board member. On the City Council, Noel is the Chairman of Veterans Services and is the City Council's representative as a board member on the Community Preservation Committee. Thanks for being here. And next up, we have another M, MFQ's own Nicole Depache, setting the ground rules and moderating tonight. So let me, can everyone hear me? Okay.
So we're good to go and we're, we're ready to get started. And thank you, Edie, for those introductions. And again, thank you to our panel of candidates for participating in this evening. And mostly thank you to all of you for being here. A couple of um, just general house things. Um, we are being recorded by QATV. It is not being live streamed, but it will be available to watch on QATV. And this event this evening is also being live streamed. Um, and our very crafty tripod over there. So it is being live streamed uh, live and it is being recorded for QA TV. I am going to start with um, just prefacing the ground rules for this evening. I want everybody to feel comfortable and relaxed. Um, this is my second, this is MFQ's second um, time partnering with the library to host this event. My second time moderating. We had a very good time two years ago and I expect that we will do so again this evening. So just to start our evening with stating the obvious, but everyone deserves respect, and that goes for our panelists as well as the audience. So this is a, um, a friendly environment, and we expect it to stay that way. We are all going to commit to, be, commit to being engaged listeners, and we will provide everyone the opportunity to participate without worry of any condescension. Nobody will speak twice until everyone has had the opportunity to speak once, and the microphone will serve as our talking stick. We agreed, to, we agreed to adhere to the two minute time limit for each question and we will graciously accept being asked to move on. If we have time to return to your point, we will. Rachel is going to serve as our timekeeper and she will be giving reminders about when you've made it to the halfway point with one minute left and when you've made it to, you have a 30 second warning and then she will give you the red stop sign knowing that it is your time to conclude your point. Um, and for the audience and everyone on the panel, just a reminder to please silence your phone and electronic devices. So we're going to start before we start with questions. And the questions were um, collected from the community. So the questions being posed to our panelists tonight are the questions of the community. And so we want to thank the community for submitting your questions and being involved in this process. So before we get started with the questions, we will go ahead and start with introductions. Um, each candidate will have two minutes to introduce yourselves to the community. So why don't we go ahead and start at this end of the table with Joanne. Thank you for inviting me. March forward, Quincy, and I'm happy to be here and share who I am. I am Joanne Sullivan. My husband is Cantor. He passed 10 years ago yesterday. We have three beautiful grown children. The youngest is Brian, 19. I hope to serve the people of Quincy. I am capable of serving the people of Quincy, and I am dedicated to serving the people of Quincy. If and when elected, I will be your representative. As a Quincy resident and Democrat, American Catholic, daughter, Navy veteran, dad, mother of three, parishioner of Sacred Heart Parish, North Quincy, homemaker 28 years. I do office support for churches, schools, and federal programs. I support low-income housing for the elderly, veterans, disabled Americans. I support Mayor Coke and all his good growth. I support a full-time ferry at Squam Point Park new handicapped MBTA trains and buses, new safe and sound streets program, new schools, parks, and buildings, new hospitals, hopefully the new St. Mary's Maternity <coughs> Catholic Hospital at Hospital Hill, the new QCAP building, Quincy Community Arts Center, hopefully to the right of Quincy High School. I support Yahoo, Medical marijuana on the against of Long Island Bridge, way with compressor station, oversized buildings, overpopulous areas, illegal citizenship. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Frank Rubino, candidate for Councilor at Large, obviously. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank March Forward Quincy for hosting us this evening, as well as the Thomas Crane Library for providing this very nice venue this evening. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. I'm 34. I live in the Quincy Point neighborhood. Um, I actually grew up in Burlington, Massachusetts, and I, and I moved to Quincy six years ago. Um, at first, I moved to Quincy just to be close to work. At the time, I had a job in, Brain in Braintree. Uh, but I found Quincy to be such a welcoming community, I decided to settle here. Um, I have a business and finance background. I went to Bentley 
University where I earned an MBA degree. Um, I, I spent, I've spent the past 10 years um, as, a, as a budget analyst um, in both the public and private sector. Um, I, since, uh, since June, I've been going all around the city, knocking on doors, chatting with residents, and some of the top concerns that, I, that I'm hearing from people are um, traffic congestion, overdevelopment, and affordability, affordable housing. Uh, so those are three issues that I would definitely want to tackle should I, uh, should I, get, should I get elected. Uh, traffic congestion, we, we can attack the, that problem from several different angles. I would really like to see the, the city partner with Uber and Lyft to come up with some solutions um, in, in that area. Um, uh, uh, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I just felt better standing up, so I hope you don't mind. I'm Anne Mahoney, and I'm a candidate for re-election. I'm currently your counselor at large. I want to thank the library and March Board for having us here this evening for this important discussion and all of the candidates that are running for office. Quincy's been my home for my whole life, but it hasn't been my home for my, the home of my husband for his whole life. He's been here now for 25 years, and he's still considered not from Quincy. My parents who live up the street from me who will be married 70 years. My mom is not from here. She's from Ireland, and she's not from Quincy either. So one of the things I'd like to think that Quincy can do is <coughs> now all of us together, and we can actually work towards making our city the best it can be. And that's something that I've tried to do in the last two years that I've been on the council, because I don't see it as just because I'm a fourth generation slash fifth generation. And my great green niece is a nephew that come to my house for Thanksgiving, or six generations. That's cool. That's very cool. I think it's great. It makes my dad very, very happy. But at my Thanksgiving celebration, we also have friends that come from India and friends that come from all over that come to our celebration. And that's what I see in Quincy. And that's why I chose Quincy as my home, because of the diversity that we have here and the strengths that we have in the people who live here. So people know me. I grew up here, and I, I have an education. I went and got my BA, and I've been working in the private sector for a long time. But what I've been passionate about for the longest time is this city, because I truly do believe in it. And with strong representation, and we say this all the time, the mayor is a strong mayor and the council is a weak council, but with strong representation for your elected officials, and that's what you guys get to do is elect people, and I hope I'm one of them. You get to elect people that represent you. And I promised two years ago that I'd be your representative. I've stood up for you. I've asked the tough questions. I don't back down. And I promise that I work towards making common goals for all of us so that we can achieve the things that we want, both in the private sector, in development, and also in our neighborhoods. So I look forward to the conversations that we're going to have here tonight, and I look forward to hopefully being your representative again on the Council at Large come November 5th. Thank you very much. Starting a trend here. Um, good evening, everyone. I, of course, want to thank March Forward Quincy, everyone who put in the work to make tonight possible, as well as Clayton, the media, and everyone at the library for having us. Uh, my name is Nina Liang, and I'm excited to run for re-election as your city councilor at large. Uh, my goal has always been to ensure that everyone's voices are heard on issues across our city and to take action to move us all forward together. Um, in my first term as your counselor, I worked to address the lack of engagement and collaborative efforts right here for downtown projects by amending the process to allow for more transparent dialogue and allowing for the city council to serve as a voice for the residents of Quincy. Uh, for fiscal responsibility, I've made sure that I held city agencies accountable not only to their budgets but also to their missions making sure that they were you know, cutting where they didn't need it, and then when they were spending your taxpayer dollars, that they were doing so responsibly, effectively, and efficiently. This term, after years of collaborative efforts between residents such as actually Frank and folks in the administration, I successfully created the city's first LGBTQ commission. And when the MBTA wouldn't listen, I demanded that they provide in-depth updates to the residents and the city, and we got almost 17 representatives to come to the hearing at the city council. I'm proud to point to some of these accomplishments, but my work is far from over. One of the things we must make sure happens is that our government doesn't forget its top priority, and that's serving all residents of Quincy. It's why I ran for office, it's why I love being your city councilor, and it has and always will be my top priority. So I respectfully ask for your vote on November 5th, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you.
one thing before I start is, you know, when, when you're on the city council, I like to work with my colleagues. When you're from the outside looking in, it's a little different. So I like to work with my colleagues. Um, I like to thank March Forward Quincy for hosting us tonight and Thomas Crane Public Library for having the venue here. Uh, my name is Noel DeBona. I've uh, been an elected official now for the last six years, four years on the city council. Um, well, some of the things I wanted to talk about real quick in my opening statements is civically what I do. Um, I, I grew up here in Quincy, uh, educated through the Quincy Public Schools, and graduated from UMass Boston with a, with a bachelor's degree. Uh, we live in the Marymount section of Quincy now with my wife, Neve, and three young children, Tyler, Aiden, and Nora. There's seven, five, and three, and all three of them are in the, public, the Quincy Public Schools. Uh, I came through the Quincy Public Schools, and um, two of them um, have special needs. Two of them are on the autism spectrum. So it's really near and dear to my heart to make sure that we have the proper funding in place for our education system. Um, public safety is the next best thing that's important, is to make sure our police and fire have the proper resources to do their jobs. And then we have to maintain our infrastructure improvements with all the development that's going on in the city of Quincy. Now civically, before I got onto the council, before I got onto the school committee member, I did a lot of things civically. I coach youth football, I currently coach youth soccer for the last 10 years. Um, part of the Sons of the American Legion, Marset Post 294, we do the flags for Veterans Island over more, uh, Fort Square. I still continue to do that since 2012. Uh, I was the Ward 2 Civic Association President in 2013. And I just do a lot of things throughout the city currently now with PTOs and, and different organizations. I feel that it's very important as an at-large councilor citywide is to be engaged all over the city with other neighborhood associations and finding out collectively what all you folks have needs and concerns and, and issues and questions that I need to pose. I have brought your voice to the city council. Everything that you've spoken about to me, whether it be on your porch door to door, whether it be via email or, or, or office hours, I've come up to the city council level and I've spoken about these issues publicly. When it's time to say certain things, I say it. When it's time to zip it up, I zip it up. But I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I humbly ask for one of your three votes tonight. Thank you so much. Very nice. So our first round of the, the candidates speaking, everyone has adhered to the two-minute rule, so thank you. So Noel, why don't you go ahead and keep control of the microphone for, for now, and I will have you start us off with the first question. So this is about the role of the city council in the strong mayor system and budget influence. How do Quincy's at-large city councilors influence the city's budget whether it's education, safety, or other priorities such as storm runoff, sewage pipe upgrades, snow removal, seawall expansion, or other infrastructure improvements. And the second part of this question is, tell us how you would work within the current constraints of the strong mayor system to help Quincy achieve our goals. Very good question. Thank you for that, uh, the opportunity to speak tonight about this. Um, first off, about the infrastructure improvements of our seawalls. Uh, tide gates and, and pumping stations. I, right after that storm of, of March of 2018, I, ran, I, I currently went out right away and got a resolution started with new seawalls and pumping stations to alleviate all that. During that storm, I was involved with being on the dike, um, helping the residents, being at the emergency shelter at Atherton Howe, helping the residents of Quincy. Um, I will be there at any time, catastrophically, events, um, as you're talking about strong mayor government and the, and the, and the budget, um, I've been a proponent to cut certain items from the budget. We as a city council cannot add, we can only decrease the budget now or cut from it. I have not voted on the tax rate this recently, this time around, because I felt like um, the taxpayers should benefit from all the development that's happening in the city. There's gonna be times where uh, I'm on board with some of the things that initiated, like education and public safety and infrastructure improvements, there's going to be other air areas of that budget that I don't feel that we need to spend like that. There's going to be areas that I don't feel that we need to bond as much as we do. Not saying we can't do a project, but sometimes you've got to say no to certain big items that just, because at the end of the day, it's your taxpayers, it's your funding. I want to see projects go forward, but I like to cut from them. Um, and I've done that in the past, in the last four years, I've cut in the budget, but remember, you have to have five votes to cut. If you have three, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If you have one, um, you don't have one of your colleagues on board. I've been on the back end of eight ones, seven twos, six threes, and five fours. So I can tell you that, um, that I'm willing to make the stands when it's the right time for it. However, you do have to work with the mayor and the administration. Because remember, at the end of the day, 
They're the ones that are going to go out there and do the work. I have a working relationship with DPW commissioners, natural resources commissioners, different, different departments where I can call them instead of going straight to the mayor. So we have to have a working relationship, but there's going to be times where I think you should cut and I have done that in the past. Thank so. you for your, your answer this evening, Noel. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I could go on for a long time on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to answer the first part about um, you know, working with capital improvements across the city that I've been proposed. So recently there was, uh, you know, this has been a five-year plan and it's an ongoing plan that's come in front of the city council. And as different projects come up, that's when they come in front of us. And like my colleague had reiterated, we cannot add to it, we can only cut or approve it. And so one of the requests that had come in front of us was for funding to redo our streets and sidewalks. Now, we certainly want to fix every street and sidewalk here across the city, but we have to be realistic about when that money gets bonded out because we as taxpayers have to pay that every time we go and bond that out. So what I did is I looked at how much we have taken out already as a city to do this work. And what I found is that nearly 30% of that funding still wasn't spent. So here we were being asked to approve additional money for this work when 30% of funding that was already approved hadn't been spent down yet. So my argument was, yes, let's fix those streets and sidewalks with the money that we've already taken out, with the money we've already bonded. And when that starts to dwindle down, you need to come back to ask for more, to continue this important work. I'd be more than happy to support it. But you can't just keep saying yes to things if you're not looking at where that money is being spent. Another thing to look at is the budget. Again, this is an area where we can't add to it, but we can cut and or approve. And when we look at the budget every single year, we do get to look back at the last three years of spending within a department. And one example that I'll give to you is one um, that I actually had a lot of fun looking through. It's the, the tree or parks department before it was changed over. And there was a line item that I found that was around $100,000. And for three years in a row, it was not being spent. So as taxpayers, we were paying for this one line item of $100,000 for three years where the money was not being spent. And it was to plant trees, <coughs> right? When you cut a tree down, you need to go back and you need to replant it. And I really appreciate the department at the time admitted we simply didn't have the capacity. We want to replant trees. It's important to replant trees. We don't have the capacity. So I said to them, okay, then you shouldn't have this additional $100,000 right now because that $100,000 is pennies, sure, but it adds up. So until they come back in front of us with the work that they can do and the work that they can actually and Thank you, Nina, for your answer. Thank, thank you. I'll just pick up where she left off. Nina, Nina, and I <laughs> Nina and I sit next to each other, so I can just pick up where she left off. So, um, and, and and I always say she's pretty kind of a yin and a yang. She asks questions and I follow up and, and we just do it a little bit differently. But similar to what Nina was just talking about is making sure that when we are bonding the money that we are actually seeing the work be done. So since I've joined the council, one of the things I ask is when we do do the budget, first of all, there's not a lot of transparency in the budget. It's a PDF that we get and we can't see it. I, I'm a big believer of open checkbook. I'm going to be pushing that until you know, until we get open checkbook in the city of Quincy. And all that is is the same thing as what you and I do when we go on to our checkbooks, when we pay our, pay our bills, and we can see how much money we have, where we spent it, where it went to. Cities and towns surrounding Quincy do that so that it builds trust in the community so that you can see where your tax dollars are being spent. We don't do that here in Quincy. And it's not even that simple for us in the council to be able to see that. We get, you know, stacks of paper, we're killing trees every day. But one of the things that I had to do once I got into the council was summer updates. So we do give it, we update the budget, we say yes to the budget, which I said no to the budget and the tax increase last time, but if we say yes to the budget and the departments get certain amounts of money, we can come back in the fall and we can audit what they've done to see what they've done and how far they've gone. And it also goes with the capital improvement. So it's not just the money that we, the salaries that we're approving, it's also finding out what's the accomplishments that we've had. Because we have to go back and actually look at those things. We shouldn't be looking at them only when they ask for more money for bonds. And we shouldn't be looking at it only when we're renewing the budget at the end of the year. This is something that the City Council can keep a pulse on to make sure that we're getting the deliveries that we expect to get back in. How many roads are getting done? Are they getting done correctly? How many buildings are getting done? The parks that we're doing? And then the efficiencies that we're having. And if we're not having efficiencies, why are we not having efficiencies? The other thing that I like to say is when it comes to the budget, I did not support the new department that the mayor came up with. I don't believe in creating jobs for people and then placing people in those jobs. I believe that we should be hiring the best qualified people for the city of Quincy, not for our family and our friends. And if we stop doing that, we start hiring people who are qualified to do the jobs, then maybe we can get more of the work done in the city of Quincy. And those are the types of things that you get with me on the council. Like, I, I'm not shy for asking those questions. So thank, thank you. you thank much. you very much, Ann. <coughs> thank you. 
Um, I think one of the most important roles of the city council in regards to the, the city's budget is to be listening to the residents, to, to hear what they want the city to be spending um, money on, as, as well as sitting down with all the department heads to hear what, they, what their concerns are regarding the city's budget and what struggles they have regarding um, the budgeting process and, and budgeting each year. Um, I, I've worked, I've spent 10 years as a budget analyst. I've done complex budgeting, financial forecasting, revenue and expense tracking, proposal pricing, and a budget needs to be very detailed. It can't just be, you know, this high level, this one number that, you know, each year gets approved or you just tack on 3% each year. It has to be very detailed. You need to see what's, what the budget is being used for, what it was used for, what it was used for last year, what you uh, what you predict it'll be, what you forecast it'll be used for next year, um, and um, I would I would push for more detail, more transparency in our budgeting process. Um, and as far as the, the second half of the question, the strong mayor <coughs> system, um, I have no problem um, voting no when everyone else is voting yes, or, or the other way around. Um, but we shouldn't be hesitant. To, to, to do that if we, if we feel like it's the right thing to do on behalf of the residents. Um, uh, and also we should be asking a lot of questions as far as um, what is this money going to be used for? How did that, how did you reach that number? Can you explain to me how you came that you came to that number? That that's the question I have to answer all the time in, in my various roles um, as, as a budget analyst. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so the strong mayor leadership and the city council, which at large represents every neighborhood in the town and the ward represents their own neighborhood, but collectively um, all should and will work together as a team um, for a meeting of the minds and resolve issues and always learning from the past travesties and make quick decisions based on immediate needs of unforeseen uh, storm issues and then build upon what you've learned and how it was fixed and get a future plan to better secure safety and infrastructure support. Do a five, 10 plus year plan, you know, like how long something lasts and start building upon when that's, you need to redo it. Um, but with global warming and all these floodings and wind and everything, uh, we can only s secure that. It's it just get to the best possible plan, you know, for what we have as our um, surrounding waters and, and <coughs> nature and winds and all that. And I think the mayor's doing a fabulous job from the ground up, uh, from the inside out of the streets, and it's very strong. And, and I think all the department heads are working with him and getting the best material and the best prices and the best turnaround time and I just I just think everything is, is looking great and that's why I want to be part of the team. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're a little ahead of time and there was a second part to this question. I'm wondering if the panel um, would be agreeable to answering the second part but at 30 <coughs> seconds each. Will that be okay? Okay. So the second part of this question is going a step further. Would you be in favor of considering the transformation of Quincy's system of governments to a weak mayor system, which is known to be more balanced and democratic? So if we can start here and we'll go down the other way. No, I think the way it works now is great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I would want to learn more about it before making a decision, but it's definitely something that I would, that, that, that piques my interest. Thank you. <clears throat> So this would be something that I think that the, the residents of the city of Quincy would have to weigh in on as well. Um, we are a strong form of mayor, we council. The bigger problem that I have with, and, and whether it's strong form of mayor or we council is, um, I, was, I was always questioning whether or not the four year term, there should be a term limit for the four years. And that's not the question you're asking, but I did do a show a couple of years ago about it and I invited all the mayors, including the current mayor, to come onto the show to discuss it when they were proposing the four year term. And one of the things that they came up with was four years, two terms limit, take a term off, and if you're really good, come back. So, Mayor, I'm not sure if we could get there, but I think we Thank you very much. 
Thank you. So I know um, in Cambridge, for example, they do have a weak mayor system and strong council, and so the mayor essentially um, becomes sort of like a ribbon cutter, and then they, the city council hires a city manager to do the job managing that city. And so if that is something that the city of Quincy wants and the residents want, then I think it's something that you know we collectively need to reach out and make sure the residents are involved in that decision, either by having it um, as a vote on the ballot or a measure that we all collectively as a community come out to explore all possible aspects of moving <coughs> forward. You know, at the end of the day, regardless of what the system is, we need to have collaborative efforts to get things done and move things forward. And that's something that I've been able to do, uh, whether it's a strong mayor or weak mayor, and I look forward to being able to do that if this is the direction. Thank you very much, Nina. Thank you. I, because of the size of the city, I do not agree with it. I like the, 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 the strong mayor government that we have. However, Remember, she's talking about term limits or, or years. We're the only body of government right now that's on a two-year term. The school committee is on a four-year term and the mayor is on a four-year term. We all have to answer to all of you every two years. And I was here two years ago in 2017 when there wasn't a mayor race. So I think that, that the skin council, maybe the at-large councilors, should have play a little bit bigger role in this type of government, in my personal opinion. I feel that we're citywide, just like the mayor, we should have a little bit more role in city government as at large councilors. So I'm pushing for us three. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. So, Noel, you were in the hot seat for the first question. We can hand it down to Nina and she can start us off for question two. So, this has to do with strategic and capital development. The revitalization of certain areas in Quincy, for example, in Quincy Center, have been presented as a success for the city. However, not all neighborhoods have received the same attention and economic support. How do you propose to manage future development and investment to distribute resources and provide support equitably across the city in a fair and balanced manner? Thank you. This is actually uh, one of the reasons I ran for office four years ago. Um, my family runs a bunch of different restaurants here across the city, and at the time, three of our restaurants were in front of a hole in the ground, uh, which is now the downtown, which is great. Um, but at the time, you know, as somebody who lived here, who grew up here, who worked for nonprofits here, who ran a business here, I felt like I had no idea what was going on, and that was really jarring. You know, it made me wonder how much does other folks don't know if they're not running a business in the downtown. And you know, while I've been able to change that process so that we can be more involved, I am concerned that you know the, the development has shifted a little bit to being more strong in the neighborhoods with larger developments, and it's not protecting our neighborhoods anymore. We're doing things piecemeal, and this is something I want to get ahead of. We are going to review our zoning laws, and I want to make sure that we do this with feedback from residents and business owners so that we can have a cohesive vision for the city that then protects our neighborhoods, it encourages smart investment, and it promotes quality economic development. We're seeing Wallace and come online with this process right now. It's in a strong AAPI community, and we need to make sure that when flyers go out and the neighbors are included, that it includes everybody who's in that neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you just, for um, clarity, say what AAPI means? Oh, sorry, um, Asian American Pacific Islander. Thank you very much. Uh, if you could, can you repeat the, the question again? Yes. The revitalization of certain areas in Quincy, for example in Quincy Center, has been presented as a success for the city. However, not all neighborhoods have received the same attention and economic support. How do you propose to manage future development and investment to distribute resources and provide support equitably across the city in a fair and balanced manner? Thank you. You're welcome. So, to, again, not to, to it's, we bounce off of each other, well. <laughs> I should sit next to each other. Um, the reality of this is that the downtown um, became a focal center for it because it was a URDP, and they're going to do something similar with Walston. Whether it's what we, is right for Walston or not, that's what they're focusing on. But what we don't have in the city of Quincy and what we do need, and other communities did this when Amazon was coming, they took advantage of the opportunity to create a branded marketing plan for their communities. Quincy didn't do that, and if we did do that, we could be actually going out and recruiting businesses to come into Quincy, because we have a lot of areas in Quincy that could be revitalized just by bringing in new businesses into those areas. Um, that's the first thing that we absolutely have to address in Quincy, and I have been pushing, I pushed in the City Council to have the Economic Development Team come up before us. They weren't quite sure what their job was, but I will be happy to help them out to figure it out. Um, but it's something that we need to absolutely push forward with. The other thing that we have to talk about, though, is the neighborhoods, and the zoning is key to this, because right now, a lot of the development that should be happening in the in the transit-oriented centers are really happening in neighborhoods. And neighborhoods all over the city, including Hospital Hill, and Hospital Hill is, a, is a, it's the largest and the most dense development that's happening, but it's happening in our little neighborhoods, too. And there's a citywide push 
of citywide neighborhood associations and citywide neighborhoods that are starting to come together and really band together. And I hope they look out to March, March Board to work with you as well to get their message out. They're all going to the planning board. I've never seen so many people at planning board meetings as, and zoning board meetings. I was there last night and the crowd was as big as you. And that's a lot to go to a zoning board meeting. But it's important that people's voices be heard because we can't wait for the zoning laws to change because the development is creeping into our neighborhoods and it's just it's destroying the one thing that makes Clinton unique and it's our neighborhoods. So those are the two things that I think we absolutely have to work on for the equitability of our city is making sure we're protecting and, and protecting the neighborhoods from the overdevelopment that's happening, but at the same time really recruiting businesses to come to Quincy, not waiting until the building is built and figuring out what should be coming, finding out what we want in our city. They did a great job with the survey in, in Wallston for what they want for Wallston. The sad part was there were 300 responders, about 25 and questions. It was a sit Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the top concerns that I hear from residents regarding development is that the, the, deve the development seems very out of place. I was chatting with a North Quincy resident a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me that these residential developments seem very out of place. You'll have a four-story building sandwiched in between two single-family homes, and it's, it's just not a good fit for a neighborhood. It creates traffic congestion in the wrong areas, and we definitely need a comprehensive re review of the zoning laws and rezone some of these neighborhoods um, with an eye towards moving more neighborhoods towards residential A, which means nothing but single family homes to protect the integrity of, of the neighborhoods and keep, keep peace and quiet in, in the neighborhoods. Um, as, far as, as far as economic development, um, I think the parking garage that's going up in Quincy Center will provide a much needed boost to the center and I would definitely uh, push for updates as far as how that's coming along and to make sure it's on schedule. Um, Wallace & Center definitely needs some work. Um, there's a lot of vacant storefronts and we should definitely be, <clears throat> we should definitely be partnering, reaching out to business owners um, for example, a business owner who has a successful shop in Cambridge, perhaps they'd be interested in opening a second location in Quincy, and we should be reaching out to them to see what we can do to make that happen, whether it be uh, do they need marketing help, tax relief, um, a change to the zoning laws. Um, it all starts with you know reaching out to people, starting a conversation, and, and, seeing, and taking it from there. Um, and I, I also want to add that um, I want to make sure that Quincy Point is not left out of the economic development because that's an area that could really use um, some new businesses. At the intersection of Washington Street and Southern Artery, there's several empty buildings and they're perfect locations for neighborhood restaurants, coffee shops, bars, things of that nature. Thank you very much. <coughs> So, um, as, as far as meeting the uh, needs of each neighborhood um, for future growth, um, I would ask each neighborhood to define their needs and their goals, and then you, you meet with the residents, and when you find out the goals for the area for growth, and to preserve the integrity and architectural um, design, also to be energy efficient, which we went over with QCAN last week, ergonomical, cleaner, greener, the right size scale building. Uh, and then once it was a good fit for that new development, then I would seek support from the council um, and the mayor for funding and zoning based on the mutual consensus that the neighborhood goals will be met. And Wallaston, um, we live in Wallaston and Beale Street, um, there was a proposal for a very, very large overscale building, and it just is not a good fit. And I understand that it looks like a nice building, but not in Wollaston because it's, it's just doesn't make sense to be there. It doesn't do anything positive in any of the areas that was presented, other than to be um, a capitalist, which we want good growth capitalists here and meet the needs of that street and area, as well as any other area. Thank you very much. And I will stand away this time over here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very good question. Um, the last six years of campaigning, 
on the, on the campaign trail door to door, the two major things that I constantly hear is traffic and overdevelopment. They've consistently been there for the last six years and they go hand in hand because one is connected to the other, like the law of physics. You know, we have to keep the integrity of our neighborhoods safe and we have to keep the character of it um, in, in harmony with what's next to it. Um, variances. We need to say no to some variances. We have to have our neighborhood meetings and we have to stand as a neighborhood and go against them. Um, it's a case-by-case -case situation every single time up there at the planning and as well as the ZBA. You have to be engaged. It's our responsibility to allow you to understand that you gotta go to some of these meetings and be against them. And that's how you're gonna do it. In certain areas of the downtown, we have to redevelop. If we don't redevelop, we're gonna lag far behind. It's a compromise. It's a negotiation. We have to give certain things to get certain things. We've done great road improvements um, throughout the city. In front of North Quincy High School, we opened that up about a, about a year and a half ago. Now we're doing the construction over there to obviously probably get a new target in there, as well with the mixed use. Over on C Street, where it actually got the DOT, we leveraged some funding between six and seven million dollars to make a, um, a right-hand turn to go on to Quincy Shore Drive. We need to do the traffic flow and patterns better. As for the back to the downtown real quick, we've just been able to get Milton Hospital to come in, Beth Israel, and, and we need to leverage other uh, medical use, urgent cares, emergency <coughs> that we lost at the hospital site. It's very vital for 100,000 people in our city to have that, and I think down the road we're gonna get that, but we have to do the redevelopment to attract these hospitals and attract these medical uses to come here. So we're in the process, we're in the middle of the downtown. I'm looking forward to continuing to be your voice on the city council, and I think we're going in the right direction with that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So we will pass this on to Anne to start us off with question number three, which has to do with how the housing affordability. It's turned into a tragedy all over the state of Massachusetts right now with development. And it's hard. I work in Boston and I see rallies all the time in Faneuil Hall for the same thing. And, you know, ability crisis. So major cities across Massachusetts are experiencing a housing crisis due to increasing unaffordability and limited housing stock. How do you propose to address this situation in Quincy to ensure that middle class, working class, and low income people can comfortably build a life in our community? Development is a greedy thing that's happening, and it's happening throughout all our communities. And every, and it's not just Quincy; it's happening in Boston. It's happening, and it's happening everywhere. It's Weymouth and Braintree. But what we really have to do is we have to make sure that we're forcing the developers not to take the option of putting 10% into a fund, but rather actually create it so that we can coexist. A perfect example of, of one that was done very well by NeighborWorks, which, which is the Watson. The Watson is a beautiful building. It, does, it may not have a beautiful view because it's across from the, the um, shipyard, but it's a beautiful building and it, it allows for people to live in dignity and it allows for people from all different levels of economics to live there as well. And there's some benefits that go along with that too. So P Quincy was a working, it's a working class city and we should really remember that as we're trying to develop it. And that's the, it should be our mission when we're thinking about what Quincy is and what we're trying to be. Because oftentimes we say we're not, we're not trying to be Somerville, we're not trying to be Cambridge, but yet we're taking the money from the, we're letting the developers develop anything they want and we're not taking control over where the direction is and going for Quincy. Where if we were really taking a step back and having a moral compass for our city, we would realize that the city of Quincy was, we're actually the taxpayers and the residents <coughs> and the voters of the city of Quincy are allowing this transformation to happen. We should be taking that into consideration as well as the people who live here and make sure that we're developing for the people who live here and for the new people who are coming here and build our community based on the things that we want instead of what the developers want. And once we take the, the, the hands back from the developers and we start pushing back and we start actually demanding certain things, we'll see those things happen. But we need to have more community involvement. We need people like yourself to come out to the meetings. Like I said, planning board and ZBAs come out and actually voice your opinion. Because developers want to develop here. But they'll develop if they know what it is that they're developing for. Right now they're developing for the potential big, big deep pocket people coming from Boston. But we want to keep a mix of people here. And we have to push back on them right now. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so I, I think we can all agree that Quincy has an affordable housing problem. Um, it, it, it's a two, the problem is twofold. It's, it's, um, the problem is, is both increasing rents as, in, as well as increasing property taxes. Uh, now as far as increasing rents, 
Um, we, we do have resources available uh, to attack this problem. Uh, there was a Patriot Ledger article from last spring that talked about the Quincy Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And at that time, there was something like $13 million sitting in that fund um, with, without any concrete plan as to how that money is going to be spent. So we do need to make sure that money is going directly towards affordable housing initiatives because that's what it's supposed to be spent on. Um, and one of the things we can do is, um, I know in Boston there's um, programs available where if, if somebody, if a renter is moving and they're struggling to pay first last month's rent and security deposit to uh, their new landlord, the problem, the, the, the fund, um, a voucher program can help with that. Um, as far as property taxes, um, I do support the, the residential property tax exemption that Councillor Liang introduced. Um, I would like to see something that's geared more towards seniors. I know that um, there's an exemption available to seniors age 65 and over, um, but you only qualify if your assets are uh, less than $45,000 and it's only a $500 exemption. So I would like to explore how we can expand that. And I believe that exemption is a state exemption that Quincy is required to follow by law. Um, so if, if we can explore something specific to Quincy geared towards seniors and helping them, help, helping ease their property tax burden, I, I would like to work on that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, so I totally agree with um, tax exemptions to lower the taxes, especially for the elderly, veterans, disabled, civil service workers, first-time home buyers. And instead of putting a new, another storage unit by Home Depot or Lowe's, maybe have a housing building for the elderly in one and veterans in another, um, because going on, I believe, and is it number that would be the fourth storage facility here? I mean, how many things do we need to collect? People are on the street, they're getting, they can't afford their homes, there's no reason for that. People first, it's common sense. Let's work together to put the people in the homes and only keep what you need. There are programs, one in New York State called the STAR program. It specifically um, gives you a tax exemption for the elderly, the disabled veterans, and um, civil service and first time home buyers. And um, that's, they're, they're, they're out there, we just need to get it done. There's also a lot of federal funded programs and vouchers that, um, and we just have to connect the people to the program and um, we're doing that and when we work together, we'll get it done. Thank you. Over the last four years of being the city on the city council, I've been the uh, representative for the community preservation committee. Um, we've worked with two projects: the Watson, where we've given four hundred thousand dollars to uh, Naval Works, and they uh, did twenty percent, which is more than the threshold of ten percent. They did forty units of affordable housing over at the Watson. Beautiful, uh, nice, um, mixed blend of workforce housing, affordable housing, and market rate. That's usually the trend that's going on today, is that, is that, that workforce housing is in there as well. Um, I think with the interest rates being so low and the housing boom really going on right now, there hasn't been a big demand for the affordable housing. It's our responsibility to get the word out there that you know the $13 million sitting in there, I think when the economy dips a little bit, I think everybody's gonna go back to that affordable housing trust and they're gonna dip into it. Uh, I've talked to building trades, I've talked to different other people, developers, Everybody's doing very well right now. It's it's a big demand from the Boston region, and I think it's supply and demand. I think when the demand goes down a little bit for that, they'll come over and try to get into the fund. So I think it's coming. One thing that I proposed for the hospital site was an over 55 community. There's not a senior housing that I go to where other folks tell me, uh, we, my, my sister would like to come and live here. There's a waiting list of two and three years. There's a huge demand of senior housing in the city of Quincy. There isn't a place I go to, is it a neighbor I talk to, neighborhood I talk to where they want to get out of their homes, it's just them, and they want to downsize into uh, an affordable place for senior housing. I proposed the four, over 55 community up, up, up on the hospital site. I think everybody would have been happy with it. They went a little different route, unfortunate. But I will continue to fight for that over 55 community. 
I think it's a big demand in Quincy. I think um, we can we can tailor it in with affordable housing. And most seniors don't drive as much, so they would be using more public transportation or other avenues, be less traffic in the city. So I think it's a win-win for everybody. I'm glad you uh, had this question tonight. It's a very good question. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Nina, you can close us out. All right, thank you. I guess I, I keep saying that community affordability is one of the biggest issues that we're facing, and my colleague is right, it's not unique to us, but it is something that we have to deal with today. Um, I am absolutely fighting for a residential tax exemption, and while a lot of folks keep telling me it's not possible, frankly, I can't take no for an answer. We are pushing commercial development. We are going to have an increase in the commercial tax base, which will offset the residential tax base, but we cannot wait 10, 15 years for that to happen. You know, there's families who have set their roots here who are getting priced out of their homes. There's young professionals who are looking to find a place to call home and can't use Quincy as that place. And frankly, when these developers are developing for millennials and saying these millennials can afford $3,000 apartments, I don't know who they're talking about. I'm a millennial and I can't afford that apartment. And frankly, the widow who owns her home and has to pay flood insurance and the residential tax rate that we have right now can't afford to wait for the commercial taxes to come online as well. So I will continue to fight to try to get any semblance of a residential tax exemption so that we can build on that, so that we can stay in our homes. And on top of that, as we are shifting to more commercial development, again, we have to look at a holistic approach for the city. We are going to look at rezoning the city, but we also have a citywide traffic study that's been done. So we need to look at a mobility plan. A mobility plan looks and says, where are you going to develop? Where are you going to high, have, have high density population? And where are those folks going to be able to get around? Do they have access to public transportation? <coughs> Do they have access to the trains, to the buses? If they're deeper into the neighborhoods, is, are they going to be more reliant on cars? We need to look at this whole as a holistic approach again to make sure that where we are going to build, people have a life that they can move around, so they don't have to sit in traffic. Um, and again, they can stay here and, and continue to call the home. So thank you. Thank you all for your thoughtful answers. So moving on to question four, and we'll start with Frank. And this has to do with transportation, traffic, and parking. And the question is, what is your solution for developing efficient, affordable, and accessible transportation options, including bikes, pedestrian, and public transit, for Quincy residents to commute and for improving the traffic and parking challenges that we currently have? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, traffic congestion is a problem that we can attack from several different angles. But we already talked a little bit about the overdevelopment and, and slowing that down. Um, another thing that we can do is to partner with Uber and Lyft because in, in cities like Cambridge, Somerville, Boston, they have dedicated curbside space in strategic locations for the Uber and Lyft to do their pick up and drop off. Instead of the Uber stopping wherever it wants and creating uh, traffic problems, it, it let's have dedicated curbside space uh, for Uber and Lyft. That's one thing we can do. Something else we definitely need to focus on is um, uh, dangerous intersections. Uh, Mass DOT tracks the number of car accidents by location each year and they've identified several high crash intersections in Quincy. So those intersections definitely need to be top priorities when it comes to safety improvements, redesigns, and I would be eager to, to, to work with TPAL um, on those initiatives. Um, uh, we, we, I'm all in favor of um, uh, making uh, bicycle initiatives, making the city more walk walkable, um, some of these things are projects that the city should have no problem doing. I, you know, I was walking in uh, the Montclair neighborhood a few months ago, and all, this, all the streets, the sidewalks, it was all torn up, but the sidewalks were buckling, and you know, it looked like the neighborhood hadn't been, hadn't been worked on in years. And we, 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 that, these are things that the city should be on top of without, without having to without having to be any you know, debate or anything. It should, should be automatically done. At least I think so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, first of all, you could see there's many incentives here with the bike paths and um, hopefully getting the full-time ferry year-round here at Squatter Point Park and um, also adding just wider lines for people to park on the side and just it's just and then the newly installed 
um, walk, don't walk, and the lighting and all that. And I just think that's really helped a tremendous amount um, initially, which is a humongous program. Um, but then continue to like just promote, you know, if you could walk there, if you're less than certain uh, miles away, then try to do this or this instead of jumping in your car because it's there. Um, it's better for your health, it's, it's better for everything. And um, I also uh, brought up, uh, sent the mayor an email for, it's called the Safe and Sound Streets Program to install, it's like a raised walk, um, it's kind of, it's not a speed bump, it's kind of like a hump and it's, it doesn't hurt the car, it doesn't hurt the people and it's for cut through streets and all the streets to slow down at a pace that uh, everyone can be safe. Traffic is the number one concern that I constantly hear over the last six years. Um, over over the last six, uh, four years of being on the city council, I think it's very important to work with your ward councilors. Each ward councilor has a jurisdiction, has a particular area, a, a, a district. Um, a lot of the uh, ward councilors, especially Ian came from Ward 3, did neighborhood meetings uh, about the traffic concerns and other ones have been, as well as like Brad Kroll in Ward 2. I attended a lot of those meetings to get a feel from the audience and get a feel from the, the members uh, at, at the meeting what their concerns were, and, and there was a lot of them. Walking down the streets near Walston Beach, the West Elms, and the East Elms, everybody's looking to do different type of parking on one side, uh, whether it be parking at different times of the year, um, whether it be in the wintertime, the summertime. We have to go street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood. Neighbors have to talk to each other in a collaborative manner uh, in a neighborhood meeting to get a consensus of what they want to do on their particular street. Every street's different, and I've gone one street, they don't want any change, and the next street over, they want so many different, they want one side parking. This is something that I'd like to work with the ward councilors moving forward. It's a concern that I'm getting with the traffic, people going down side streets and cutting through these big major streets. It's, it's, it's an issue, and it's a pedestrian issue as well. Uh, for our pedestrians because we want to make it very friendly. But I, I feel that traffic is something that we're going to have to evolve into. It's, it's looking, the trend is that a lot of people don't, uh, a lot of houses have two and three and four vehicles now. A lot of the children are living in the houses, coming back from college, they have another extra vehicle. We have to find a way for neighbors to talk to each other and alleviate the parking plan and the parking issues. And I, I continuously advocate for more parking in the downtown to help out in the outskirts of these neighborhoods. So it, it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge. We're gonna have to work from neighborhood to neighborhood, ward council to ward council, but I'm willing and I have been working with them consistently to make alterations and changes moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so whenever I talk about traffic, I like to break it down into a couple of different things. It's congestion, pedestrian safety, bicycle safety, and alternative means of transportation. Uh, the congestion that we're having across the city is not helped with the development that we do have going on here in the city. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier with my mobility plan. I'm not opposed to having development in certain areas of the city that, again, protect the <coughs> neighborhoods. But while we're also looking to develop in these certain areas to have more housing options available, we need to look at how those new tenants are going to get around this city. Are they going to be transit-oriented development projects that are right over the train? And are they going to be able to get on a train in the morning when they do decide to use that for transportation options? You know, my colleague mentioned Hospital Hill earlier. Those folks say, you're so close to Quincy Center. These folks aren't going to use their cars. They're not going to have cars. Well, there's things called Uber and Lyft these days, and those add congestion to the road. So yes, I might not have a car, but maybe I'm gonna use Uber. That's still another car that's on the road. So again, going back to this mobility plan that I wanna implement, we do need to make sure that whatever it is we're doing in the city, we look at the traffic mitigation and the implications that come with each of these projects. I also just want to point out, um, Senator Keenan joined us here tonight. I want to thank him because he inspired me and also gave me some guidance when I held the MBTA seat to the fire. Look, we have four train stations here in the city. We have one commuter rail, we have a bus line, and they constantly come back and tell us, you're welcome, we fixed your wall station for you. It is now accessible, great. Accessible for who? So I can sit on the platform and wait for a train to come that I can't get on? We need to make sure that if we're going to be reliant on an alternative means of transportation, that they are reliable, that they do answer to our needs, and that they are gonna be held responsible when they fall short. So all of these paths have to happen at the same time, and traffic has to be viewed in all these aspects in order for us to alleviate the problem that we're facing today. Thank you. So thank you for this question, because this is an important one. 
And it all stems from the same thing. We are developing in our city and we're pretending like we already fixed all the other problems. We haven't fixed any of the problems. We didn't fix the parking problem before we started to allow these developments to happen and telling them they only needed 1.25 parking. So what we should have done and we need to do very fast is do a parking permanent program throughout the whole city. That doesn't mean that all of you have to pay for parking permits, but we should have a parking permit so we know who's living in our neighborhoods, who's living on our streets, they're our, they're our neighbors. And if you're not our neighbor on our street when we call, we don't have to take up a whole street, we'll just be taking the people that shouldn't be on the street. That would be the first thing we have to do. Mobility is a very important thing too, but we don't have a comprehensive traffic study. What we have is a TPAL that's going into areas of our city saying we're gonna make one street a one way, another street a one way, a different way, not talking to neighbors, not having community meetings. That's where we're really missing out, is we're not talking to the people who live in our communities. The universal part that we can do with parking is if we're gonna make a street, if everybody's gonna have to park on one side of the street, it should be something that's uniform throughout the whole city. Cambridge did it, Boston did it, every place that had large development has done it. And when it comes to the MBTA, I can tell you that I am an MBTA commuter. I commute every single day. I see a lot of people on the train. When they came to Wallston before I was actually inaugurated in MBTA, I stood up and I questioned their project plan six weeks out before they shut down Wallston. Yes, they got it done in two years, but they displaced a lot of people. I was able to make sure that the MBTA provided Quincy residents or anybody that had a Charlie Pass to be able to ride the commuter rail for the same price as you ride that red line. I was also able to convince them to come down from $5 to $2 to park in Wallston and actually to get an extra commuter train, tra uh, bus, uh, uh, shuttle bus to go to Quincy Center. These are things that you need for your representatives to do and we shouldn't have been having meetings six weeks out. And I don't care, the MBTA is a separate, a separate entity from the state, but they can't come in and tell people what they're gonna do and, what, and how it's driven is by the people who live here in the city of Quincy and the amount we push back. And we have to do that. The other thing that I was very proud of is while I was running for, for Council of Arts two years ago with Smart Lights, I brought them up, they instituted it, and the summer updates will be getting Thank you the very much. The information for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. So for question five, we'll start with Joanne. <coughs> and this has to do with climate change and flooding. So Quincy's geography is susceptible to climate change. The rising sea levels and increasingly harsh weather, including the disastrous flooding across various neighborhoods that we experienced last winter, are proof of the negative effects on our community. Can you share one or two concrete proposals that you have in mind to address these challenges, including minimizing the impact of new development, <coughs> e.g. the known flooding issues caused by the new YMCA facility? Well, the sea walls I mean, that's all coming to higher, better, stronger. Um, I'm a little bit, I'm a couple blocks in from the beach, but um, Squanum and Howes Neck, um, the ward councilors have spoken, you know, collaborated with the mayor and everybody's gone together with environmentalists to find out what is needed for that. And I know it's, it's in the plan to get done. Um, and then they looked forward for different types of impacts should that type of storm come back again, it comes back again, or would they foresee? And so I'm not aware of the particulars of that, but I know it's being worked on. I support whatever they would recommend um, and any funding for it. And there's a lot of different types of funding from the local, state, and federal to get that done. It's uh, people's safety first um, and their homes and, and everything else um, as well as far as the South Shore YMCA the flooding I've, I've been a member there up until January of last year and I'm not really aware of okay you know I know that that was wetland they filled it in but I don't we moved here in 2012 so <coughs> um, but that should always be a concern and it always should be addressed and you shouldn't put a building on something that has issues unless you take care of it I mean, from the infrastructure up, so you don't put the house on sand. Thank you very much. Thank you for this question. We just had a candidate behind the queue can over uh, right across the street here, and the uh, question was asked, and I said, well, we have to bring the scientists, we have to bring the people that are specialized in this area to the table, willing to probably do that going forward. Uh, climate change is real, it's happening. And look at all these catastrophic events that have happened. I'm not a scientist. I'd like to bring people that are skilled in this profession, 
and have a background in this and bring them to a table. Maybe have a commission on the city on the you know the city council. Maybe have a commission uh, uh, from the mayor's uh, administration. Uh, moving forward, we have to do uh, you know this climate change with the catastrophic events that are happening. Um, I put forward a lot of resolutions, and we're getting we, we just approved over twenty million dollars worth of, of seawalls and uh, pumping stations, and and and, and also um, you know studies on different areas of the city. Uh, I've worked with the emergency management department and the director on uh, reestablishing the establishing CERT, which is a you know citizens emergency response team, which folks like yourself can take classes and, and become uh, you know get a certificate in this to help during these issues and things happening. But we need to look better at our uh, seawalls, our outfall piping, our catch basins, our tide gates. It all goes hand in hand. We have to do the infrastructure. Now we're probably going to be going up two feet in height. Some areas may be going up four feet. We're in the, um, the stages of permitting, and we're, we're going to be moving forward this, especially from Chickatauga Road all the way down to House Neck, uh, possibly down the road, maybe <coughs> even into Swanham and along the Walson Beach area. Um, 27 miles of coastline, we, we, we are bound to get these issues happening. But we need to be preventative. We need to be proactive on these issues. We need to bring the folks from QCAN and other departments forward so they can talk about these things and educate the public on what's going to happen for the future. So I'm looking forward to getting everybody to the table, like I said at QCAN, and allowing these discussions to happen. And I think we can facilitate that at the city council level moving forward. So I, I thank you for this question tonight. I feel that we, we need to address it, and I'm going to look forward to addressing it uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, being, I, so I talked earlier about some of the capital improvements we're doing across the city, and I'm really excited about them. Um, while it's an ongoing process and it certainly doesn't happen overnight, and I'm still pushing back because I do want the work done uh, sooner rather than later, it's really important, right? Our, our city is very old, and the infrastructure work needs to get done. Um, I remember when they were doing the work in front of our restaurants, they shut off the water by accident because they didn't know the water pipe was there. And it's, that's how old the city is, that's how old our pipes are. So we can't keep patching things and putting band-aids on things. We do have to put in the work and the time to fix our infrastructure. The same goes for our seawalls. We can't continue to patch them the way that we have been in the past. We see how devastating that is if we continue down that path. So we are going to redo the seawalls. We are going to redo our infrastructure. And we're also going to look at, again, the tide gates. And we have to look at when projects are getting done, how that impacts these tide gates. What is the water runoff when you dump a bunch of concrete in a wetland area? What is the long-standing impact of that? And again, this does go back to zoning at the end of the day. What areas are you developing in? What neighborhoods are you developing in? What lands that should be preserved are you developing in that you shouldn't be? And so these are things we have to look at holistically while we are still working on uh, improving our infrastructure systems underground in this city. Some of the things that I've done personally as your counselor is I sponsored with our colleague who's no longer with us, uh, Councillor Joe Finn, the request to have our city fleet change over from the vehicles that we have now to electric and hybrid vehicles. And I'm really excited to see that come online. I also chair the committee that's going to move forward and hopefully pass the plastic bag ban ordinance. Um, these are little steps, you know, that we can take along the way, but they do have a lasting impact, not just for us and for our future here in the city, but across the world that hopefully, uh, you know, we can make a difference with, with what's going on with climate change. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for this question. So, when it comes to when it comes to this, the first thing that we have to take control over again is development. Oftentimes, what we're having is we're having developers go to zoning and go to um, go to ask for variances for being able to build in flood zones. When me when mentioning the YMCA, the YMCA went before the planning board and went before the zoning board and basically said they were going to fix the problem, not create a problem. And they created a problem in a neighborhood and just. Two weeks ago, they actually approved in the zoning board because the planning board did, didn't have a quorum and it got pushed onto zoning. But they went ahead and they approved Spear Street and Newcomb Street for development. The same neighborhood that was being flooded out by the YMCA has a new development that's going in in that area that's going to flood them out even more. So the house that's in between the YMCA and the new development across the street is going to get flooded even more because they're actually being built on its sea level. It's, it's downtown Quincy Center sea level that we're developing on. So. When we talk about that, it really comes back down to that very same thing, which is zoning and development. The thing we have to keep our eye on in Quincy, and I, I agree, I approved, I approved the seawalls as well, we do have to develop those, but the thing that we really have to keep our eye on is FEMA, because FEMA is setting new rules that they're gonna be coming out within 2021, and we need to get ahead of that to make sure that we're protecting the people that live in the city of Quincy and that are in that flood zones, because it's gonna cost us more in the long run for our insurance. 
And if we don't follow the rules or start establishing rules to future plan for flooding, we're gonna get penalized in Quincy. And that's where we really have to start focusing on is that's where we can be preventive is by being able to understand what we're doing, when we're developing, and how it's impacting our city and our neighborhoods in the zoning in the area as well. I also have, um, I, when it comes to charging and electric cars, I think what we really need to do is start enforcing and maybe even reaching out to some of the larger parking lots and start putting up um, putting up charging stations for people because we're not really very friendly in Quincy for anybody that has an electric car. There's no place to charge right now. Um, the, new, the new garage will have an electric charging station, but we can't actually start putting fleets into, into our our um, city city cars until we actually have a place for them to charge things. Um, I'm also in favor of the plastic. Thank you very much, I Anne. I will tell you, my 93 year old father's not going to vote for me. Because Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 the, um, the, um, the, the March 2018 nor'easter is probably going to happen again, and it could be a much more severe storm than what happened in March of 2018. And I think the I think what we need is uh, very strong communication as to what's what the plan is to deal with that kind of a storm um, and what what the recovery plan is to deal with that kind of a storm because it's going to take a team effort for us to recover from a, a severe storm. <coughs> and I think the city needs to communicate strongly as to what the plan is to deal with a strong storm. Um, What's concerning is that Quincy, as compared to the rest of the state, the state seems to be more of a follower instead of a leader when it comes to these environmental initiatives. It happened with plastic bags. It happened with LED street lights. It happened with converting the city, the city's fleet of vehicles to electric vehicles. Uh, you know, we don't have to wait for 80 other Massachusetts cities and towns to pass these initiatives before we do it here in Quincy. And th these are the kind of things I would fight for um, on, on the city council. Um, I was a volunteer with Quincy Climate Action Network on the Solarize Quincy initiative from a few years back. That was an excellent initiative that we did here in Quincy. I would like to see something similar where we try to um, convert as many homes as we can from oil to natural gas heat, perhaps, and we can achieve that by partnering with MassSave. Um, I also want to say that in the next few years, there, there are two public buildings that are likely going to be torn down and rebuilt, the police station and the Squatting Elementary School. So we need to make sure those buildings have uh, very strong energy efficient features, and these are the kind of questions that we should be asking the architects, the engineers, when they present updates to the city council as to the status of and the plans to those buildings. Thank you very much, and we will go back around to Noel. So our sixth question for the evening has to do with embracing diversity and recognizing and honoring that Quincy is a diverse city. How do we continue to honor this diversity and ensure that we maintain a safe and welcoming community for everyone? By electing and re-electing people that are of race. Um, I'm biracial, Italian, Thai American. Um, not only along with Nina, the two Asian Americans up at the city council level. We don't seem to have, um, with the exception of Ian Kane being on the ward, ward councilor, um, uh, the school committee level is to have diversity at that. Um, we have a lot of uh, Asian American children in our Quincy Public Schools. We need to diversify and we need to have people like yourself running for these positions um, at the city council as well as the school committee and the mayor, mayor uh, being a representative there. So um, we have one in our state delegation with Tacky Chan. So um, I think uh, you, we, we had this question um, at the uh, quarry um, meet the candidate meet the candidate night about um, our police force and our firefighters. We need to uh, allow uh, the civil service tests and the educational background that the, when these tests are going to be available and market it to uh, our, our, our ch children in the middle school and high school level. That's how you're going to diversify your city. So um, I think, you know, what better to do that is, is if you are of, of, the, of a descent, um, is to allow, uh, you know, to have that diversity. Um, you know, we have to look outside the box with, with other avenues of doing that. What are other towns and cities doing? You see, the Boston City Council is very diverse. 
very, very diverse. And I've seen them become, uh, move up the ladder and, and diversify. So Quincy is definitely a melting pot uh, with all different uh, nationalities as well as sexual orientation, which I, I welcome. Um, I think we have to do better with, uh, with the female, um, with women being on police force, firefighters as well. So I think it's across the board, not just racially, but also um, um, if other, 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 you know. Um, so this is a collaborative effort that we need to move forward with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this important question. I do want to just point out um, that in this room, with March Forward and the event that you guys are doing, you do have diversity in this room, and that's a really impressive thing for us. You know, this is our third or fourth debate. Um, this is the most diverse room that I've seen, and I'm really proud of that. And I, I want to thank you guys for putting in the effort. You know, uh, regardless of what the issue is, when folks call me, um, one of the things I've been really proud of in my time as a counselor is that I can answer the phone and speak to folks in two different languages. It's an incredible thing to be able to do that. It's an honor to be able to do that. But I will tell you, the issues are all the same. You know, they can call and say something to me in Chinese or in English, and it's that their taxes are too high, or that the tree has been broken and it needs to get cut down. It doesn't matter what language it is that they're saying. The important thing is that they're reaching out, that they're connecting, that they are taking ownership of the fact that this is their government, and we are here to serve them, and we are here to work for them. And that's what diversity as your elected official needs to meet, is that everyone in this city, regardless of where you're from, regardless of what your last name is, regardless of what language you speak, that you know this is your city, you are welcome here, and that your elected officials are here to serve you, all of you. And regardless of what language you speak, you have a voice in the city council, you have someone that will stand up and fight for your issues, because again, regardless of what your background is, we are all here in the city, we all are facing the same issues. Traffic is horrific, right? Taxes are too high. Our schools are getting a little bit too large for the sizes right now. We need to look at what we're doing in our schools. All these issues are the same across the board, and it's been an absolute honor to be able to see, over time in my time as a counselor, more folks in different communities coming out and being represented, more folks at community meetings, at planning board meetings, at zoning board meetings, and speaking up and being part of this community. I think that's the most important thing. It's something that we need to continue to support, and I look forward to working with March Board Quincy because clearly you guys are, are doing the right thing. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for this question as well. So I, I'm going to repeat maybe some of the things that my fellow colleagues have said, but diversity is something that makes Quincy unique in my, in my opinion. So it's the reason why I stay here. I, it's the reason why I chose to come back to Quincy and raise my three kids here. And the reason is it's because it's, it's truly an opportunity. When I, my, my children graduated from high school, I used to say that we had the UN in my backyard. When my sister's kids graduated in Norwell, they didn't have the UN in, UN in their backyard. And it's, it's really impressive to see how many different dialects are spoken in our Quincy Public Schools. And we match that by making sure that there's translators for all of those kids as well. And I've gone out to many senior houses. We have a large population of Arme Ar Armenians that are in our population. And, and I've had translators come out to help me speak to people. Because often, just as Nina just said, the commonality is our problems. It doesn't matter what language we've spoken. When I've gone out and spoken to people at different senior houses, I've asked them the fear of if they have an emergency. I, I've been in a different country and I've had to be taken by ambulance to a, to a hospital. It's scary if you can't speak the language. So those are the things that we really have to fix here in the city of Quincy. But some of the things that I'm really proud of in the city of Quincy about bringing diversity together is, um, Quincy, when I ran for office, and, and I've been in office for a long time, I helped people in the Quincy Public Schools, whether it was um, new students that were coming into our schools that were transing, or just the LGBT community. But when I got elected as a counselor at large, I asked for a day of pride in Quincy, and I was told we would think about it from the mayor's office. And instead, we were organized around my kitchen table, and we created, the L we created Quincy Pride. And I'm happy to say that we have had two Quincy Pride days with City Quincy, and they're a 501c3 right now. The other thing that we didn't have, and it came up here at your debate two years ago, is we did not have a defunct disabilities commission. How horrifying is that, that we in the city of Quincy have a commission on our, on our boards but didn't actually have anybody meeting for seven years, yet we've had all of this development happening in our city? That's an embarrassment that, that nobody should have to stand with. And I made sure that we're instituting the Disabilities Commission. It will be up and operational the first meeting they promise will be in November. And I'm very proud of those things, as well as economic diversity in the city. Thank you very so much. I feel like we are part of this community. So thank you, Anne. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, I've been involved in uh, numerous diversity initiatives over the years. Um, 
I, um, specifically in regards to the LGBT community, I was the organizer of LGBT Quincy Meetup, and we provided uh, many networking opportunities to Quincy's LGBT community. Um, I was also the treasurer of Quincy Pride, and we organized Quincy's first and then second uh, LGBT Pride Day, which was an enormous success. Um, the um, I think there's a lot more we can do. Um, one of the areas that has caught my interest is um, uh, immigrants here in Quincy. We have a, a very large um, Asian American population. Uh, one of the uh, one of the, the issues that are important to immigrants is the citizenship process. And um, I actually learned a few things about the citizenship process. Um, my partner is Vietnamese. Um, he's a Vietnamese immigrant, and he uh, he just recently went through the citizenship process. And um, I was surprised how a complex, how much of a complex process it was. There was a mountain of paperwork. He was spending thousands of dollars on lawyers, meeting with lawyers, immigration officers, um, and it was just a very complex, stressful process. Uh, but we're happy to say that he's been approved, and he's now a U.S. citizen. Um, and one. Uh, So I would like to do some, some outreach um, in, in that area, and I, I would really like to reach out to Project Citizenship, the Boston-based organization, to see if they'd be interested in coming to Quincy for, to hold a workshop, a forum, an event on the topic of the citizenship application, the citizenship process um, for people who are interested in, in, in that area. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe the question was, how do we embrace diversity? So I don't believe in embracing diversity. I believe in embracing unity. Divided we fall, united we stand. Everyone has a different hat. We're people first. We need to respect one another. Everyone is from somewhere else. My, on my dad's side is Irish and German. My grandpa's from Ireland. My grandma's family's from Germany. My mother's from Cuba, Spain, and France. She came here as a teenager, ESOL, she had to learn English, um, became a U.S. citizen, everybody works hard, everybody gets along, everybody's happy to be here. We need to help them connect to our culture, uh, our new culture from their culture, and build upon and learn from their culture. I think it's important that we just show each other respect, no matter what your um, orientation is, because it's not about that, it's about your character and, and uh, helping yourself, your family, and other people get along. And um, I think that it's important to have translation. We have many, many different languages. I worked in Quincy Public Schools, I worked in churches, I worked nonprofit, I volunteer all over the place. And the key thing is to supply them with material so they can make an educated decision on what their choices are and how, you know, what, what is being said and what they need to do. And uh, learn about their culture and and their foods and their music and everything, and um, you know, the more the merrier. Just, just do it respectfully. Thank you very much um, for everyone for answering that question so thoughtfully. Um, I'm, where are we starting now with Miss Nina? And we're doing well with time. Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Well, too much. Hmm? Okay. So this one is about cultural investment and recognizing that Quincy doesn't need to be a bedroom community for newcomers of any age. So how would you support a cultural scene that provides diverse options for Quincy residents and visitors? And the second part of this question is how can the city become a beacon of culture where music, book clubs, round tables, theater, and other art exhibits become quintessential events in the city of Quincy? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is something um, that I think we are on the start of, certainly, and uh, we can point to uh, the activities that are going on here in the city right now. Uh, most recently, Quincy Asian Resources Annual August Moon Festival has become uh, partnered with the city and has become an actual city event now. And so while they host other events throughout the year, the August Moon Festival is a great time where the community comes together and celebrate families and friends, and now the city is responsible for hosting that. Uh, it's just one of the many events that the city has been putting on throughout the year. And I think we need to continue to advocate for uh, events like this across the city so that we can promote the diversity that we do have here, even outside of the Asian American community. 
And what we can do to promote other things such as the arts is work with folks like John McDonald, who is somebody who's amazing here in the city. He has been promoting the arts for quite some time, and we have been working with him to try to create more activities for folks like that to do that kind of work here. You know, we are seeing a lot of restaurants here in the city, and while I love to eat, it cannot be the only attraction we have here. I would love to see some more things where folks can walk around with their families, with their partners, and just take a stroll and see where it is that they want to shop. What do they want to see? Do they want to see a show? Do they want to go to the bookstore? Do they want to go buy some cards that they need to bring home? We don't have the diversity in our businesses and our local businesses quite yet, but I think that we do need to move in that direction if we're going to see something that's going to be sustainable here in this city. And so that is something that I'm working on and advocating for when we're moving over to look at Wallison as well. Um, and it is something that I'm going to continue to advocate for as far as the activities go that the city embraces and endorses. So I'm really excited for it. Um, I love working with small businesses. I'm really excited to see more of them um, come to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that's unique about Quincy is we are close to Boston. And um, they just had the Arts Fest, and somebody reached out to my oldest daughter and asked if she'd be interested, because she just graduated from Mass College of Art, so did my son. And it was interesting, because I had said this a couple years ago when I was running for mayor, that we really need to reach out to watch how other communities have done it. Cambridge and Somerville and Brooklyn, they all did the same thing, where they invited artists to come live in our community. Well, our community is getting too expensive to live in for ourselves to live in, but what we really need to do is really encourage people from Mass Art or from the creative, the creative flair that we have all around us and bring them back here to Quincy. We do have incredible artists here in Quincy, but artists actually feed off of each other. So what you really want to do is actually invite more to come to Quincy and let them know of the great resources that we have, which we do have down on School Street. There's a little, there's a little artist area that you can go and you can take um, classes at. And really what they were asking my daughter to do is come up with a program for them to kind of entice more younger people to kind of come and use that space. And that's some of the things that we don't really use, utilize a lot, is really looking back at the people that live here in the community and some of the talents that they have here in the community and invite them back to help grow our community. And we really should be reaching out. We also have a really great culinary institute right here in Quincy, right in the schools, the Quincy Public Schools. We could be reaching out to some of the culinary institutes as well as to bring them here to Quincy. It's that kind of satellite programs that are happening. We have a really incredible opportunity, but we don't actually utilize anything in Boston. And I'm not quite sure why that is. I know that the superintendent looked uncomfortable when he was at, you know, we used to go to robotics at BU in Boston. He used to look uncomfortable when he was outside of Quincy. And I'm not sure how often the mayor goes into Boston, but we have incredible resources that we could be partnering with, with some of the institutions that we have in Boston, and bringing a lot of it right here. And we have incredibly talented people right here that could benefit from it, and it could actually also grow our diverse community. Along with the fact that we have August Moon that actually is an incredible event. We also have Quincy Pride that's new and established too, but we have all these other things that are happening as well, but they all could benefit from the same things that I just talked about, and it wouldn't be hard to do. But a marketing, branding, and element in the city has to happen before any of those things can happen as well. Thank, Thank you very much. And I'll push that economic development department. <coughs> the, um, uh, the Quincy Symphony Orchestra is, is a wonderful organization, um, but I feel like many people in Quincy don't realize that they exist. I, I would like to see them, them have a higher profile here in Quincy, the Quincy Symphony Orchestra. Um, the Quincy Art Association is another great organization, the Culinary Institute. Um, I think that instead of, I, I think it's, it seems like most of these organizations sort of operate on their own. If, if, and if we can bring, if we can organize an arts and culture fair and bring together all, all these organizations, um, together at once, it'll. I think it can go a long way towards generating some of <coughs> them, um, as far as our arts and culture here in Quincy. And we can also have um, all, all organizations have a table where they can have handouts, <coughs> like, like similar to the August Moon Festival. Um, I, I think it's an excellent way to um, uh, get more people interested in community involvement, as well as um, as well as people who might come to the city on occasion, but don't, um, but what might want to get more involved in the city. And, and also, also keep in mind, Quincy has a very rich history. Um, the new Hancock Adams Common just opened, which was recently opened last year. I feel like we should be getting more use out of that. Um, I remember when I was a kid, we would take field trips to uh, Plymouth, uh, Salem, <coughs> Um, and I feel like um, schools should be taking their field trips here to Quincy to see the center, see the, the statues, John Hancock, John, John Adams. I think that will be an excellent um, new initiative for Quincy. Thank you. So 
One of the reasons we moved to Quincy was, um, was close to Boston, and I have to say, in the eight years we've lived here, I, I've very rarely gone to Boston because I, I know Quincy has so much to offer here. I've been involved with the Quincy Symphony Orchestra for years as the chair of the Guild, um, also a volunteer with uh, Wallace and Beach, Friends of the Blue Hills, the Yacht Clubs, the Green Space, outdoors, hiking, uh, it's just as beautiful and only getting better. Um, I'm part of the council regarding a new performing arts center. I'd like to see that called QCAC, because we don't have QCAC, Quincy Community Arts Center. It would house the QSO, the Quincy Choral Society, um, the performing arts, comedians, musicians. Um, it'll be horticulture as well, inside and out, local artists, uh, a nice venue, hopefully to the right of Quincy High School to let the left the facts and field, but again, if the land is sound enough and the infrastructure is, is created in the right way, um, which I did speak to an attorney here and he said that it was possible, but it's something to be found out down the, down the way. Um, we do have um, our first historical first fair Saturday, Saturday after Thanksgiving, I believe is the date, but it is in November. Uh, John McDonald is behind it. Um, I'm also part of that. Uh, council and that is an arts um, and culture fair uh, and it's been reached out to many many uh, areas here and as I've been going around to different businesses and people and I've been collecting their cards and their artists and their studios and they want to be a part of it so it's coming. Thank you very much and then we will let you could hand that down actually. Noel will close us out. One thing that's very important for us to also have in conjunction with this is a proper uh, uh, open space, parks, and recreation area for this. Um, just We just recently had Adams Field by Passion Field where we had the Arts Fest where the Quincy Symphony Orchestra played there. We have to, and it was very, very, um, very well attended. There's quite a bit of people there. We, we talked there. Um, but we have to do uh, events like that. Uh, just recently in the last couple of years, the Porch Fest which is started off in Wollaston Hill and branched out to Marymount and branched off to um, Swan and, um, you know, Ian Kane, Ward 3 Council, Walter Hubley started that and it's been great. It's been very well uh, attended. People from outside the city actually come here just for it. Um, they originally started that in um, uh, Cambridge and Somerville. Um, but you also have, we have cultural festivals inside of our Quincy Public Schools. I've attended a few of them, over the, um, especially at the elementary school level, and they have them at the middle, as well as the high school. Is all of our 19 schools, we have them inside the, each school, and it allows the cultural uh, differences and, 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 and you know, the regions they come from to have these uh, events and, and, and talk a little bit about um, their heritage, which is a great thing to do. Our downtown infrastructure and our walls and center revital revitalization is very important to include these new arts. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have that Walston Theater anymore, which was very, very, very nice, and, and it, it just tore apart, and we were revitalizing that area, but we need to have it in the Walston Center, we need to have it in North Quincy T-Station area, we need to have it at Quincy Center, and throughout the city of Quincy. We've done other, other things, also like the food truck festivals. Um, I've seen a lot more churches in different denominations. We need to, and they've done a lot of uh, activism work at different playgrounds and, and, and different fields, and, and, and we need to bring everybody together. Um, and I think we're in the farmer's market. There, there's a lot of different things that we do across the city to diversify and, 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 and get inclusion and in everybody involved. So I think we need to piggyback off of each other and the different events that we've done. Uh, I think uh, looking forward, this will be something that we'll be doing more of. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So I want to, before we get to closing remarks, I just want to thank everyone for being here, but most of all I would like to thank our panel of candidates for a very informative and respectful evening. I think we've learned a lot about you and your passion for the city and your ideas to continue to help Quincy develop and grow. So thank you very much to our panel. And so um, we also want to make sure that we recognize the library and being a wonderful partner and for making this evening possible and for being just a really amazing host. And so we started at this end of the table and we can start at that end of the table for your closing remarks in two minutes each. I want to thank everybody for coming out here tonight. You know, I look around the room and I see 
people that I've already know who they're going to vote for. So here tonight, I'm asking you for maybe a second or third vote. I'm looking at each one of you, and I kind of have an idea which candidate your kind of your number one is. If I can somehow get you to be number two or number three of your second or third vote, that's what I'm trying to do here tonight. You know, I'm I'm raising a family here. Um, they're all in the Quincy Public Schools. I was educated through it. I I. I put my heart and soul into this. Why do I want to run for re-election? All the teachers and the professors and the coaches and all the mentors that gave me um, the courage and the confidence to do something. They did it for me. Now it's time for me to give back to the city that I love. I have a vision for this Quincy community. I will always let everybody, everybody gets a seat at my table, no matter what. I want to hear your voices and I want to speak to them at the city council level. <coughs> talk is cheap. Are you going to talk about it up at the city council level? Um, the last four years, and even on the school committee prior to that, I've talked about all the issues and concerns of all of you. Um, if I haven't, I've, I've conducted office hours over the summer when we have the summer break. Gives you an opportunity to come face to face. Um, David from QCAN came in. We talked about different initiatives, different things that he wanted to bring to the city council. I'm willing to open my door and open my phone and email to all of you here tonight. Um, if we haven't spoken in the past, we can build a type of relationship and work together on achieving the common goal to make Quincy a better place to live. I'm fully invested in this city, and I, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I humbly ask for one of your three votes tonight. Thank you so much. with us here tonight. This is a really great forum that you guys put on and all of you uh, really you know, took the time tonight to be here and to listen to us and I really appreciate that. Um, my name is Nina Liang and I am your city councilor at large. I'm not the new kid on the block anymore, uh, but that has not and will not stop me from being your voice for our city. It will not stop me from asking the tough questions. It will not stop me from holding people accountable. And most importantly, it will not stop me from fighting for you and for the future of our city. You know, four years ago when I first ran for office, I ran for this Quincy as my home. It's where I was born, raised, work, and live, and I wanted to find ways to make our city stronger and better and more reflective of our diverse community. I will keep fighting to hold the MBTA accountable for all of us. I will keep fighting to make sure that your voice and every voice in Quincy is heard. I will keep fighting to make sure that our small businesses thrive and that everyone who calls Quincy home feels safe and welcome here. I said earlier that our government must not forget its top priority, and that's serving the people of Quincy. Again, it's why I first ran, it's why I love being your city councilor, and it has and always will be my top priority. This is our city, it's our future, and I am and always will be your voice. I humbly ask for your vote on November 5th, and thank you again for your time. I don't know if I'm going to be as polished as Nina. I've been around for a long time, though. So I want to thank you all for coming out as well and for your great questions. They were important to all of you, and they're important to me, too. I'm a person of action, so when I do, and I appreciate very much, two years ago, I worked very, very hard to get elected, and I'm hoping I'm working just as hard today to get elected again, because while I've been your counselor, I've been asking tough questions and holding our administration's feet to the fire, as well as our state to the fire with uh, the MBTA. So I don't, I, I, I don't just ask questions at meetings. If I can't get things to happen at a city council meeting, I go out and I work with the community. When I, can't, when I couldn't get the MBTA to work with me directly, I was on the phone with John Keenan. He knows I called him regularly. I was, I was posting and, and tweeting away, and I get invited to a regular meeting every Friday now with the MBTA letting us know what, what train stations are down and what's up, and I get to ask all sorts of questions, and I love asking them. But my point is, is whether I can get it done inside the city well or not, I will stand outside and I will work with all of you to help you help yourself in your neighborhoods. And that's what I have been doing. I've been doing that for 12 years while I was on the school committee. I've been doing it for the last two years as your city councilor. I'll do it whether I'm an elected official or not because I believe in the city and I believe in the future growth of our city and I believe in everybody who lives here. And what will make us stronger is if we work together to build the community that we want 
and make sure that the development and the types of businesses that are coming to Quincy are the places that we want to shop at and the places that we want. And to do that, you have to have active participants in your city government that are not going along to get along, that are willing to ask the tough questions and vote with the same questions that they're asking. So I'm not going to ask a question, get a different answer, and go, yeah, I guess I'll go along with you. I'm going to vote no when the appropriate thing is no. And I'm going to stand with the constituents who voted me in because that's who actually matters, not the developers. So let's all work together to make Quincy as strong as it can be and elect people who are going to represent you, not represent the developers in the city of Quincy, but actually represent you. So I humbly ask for your vote on November 5th. Ann Mahoney, I'm number three in the ballot, and I really do need your help to get in because this mouth gets me into trouble. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank March Forward Quincy for hosting us this evening, as well as uh, the Thomas Crane Library for providing the venue. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for coming out tonight and, tonight and joining us. Um, uh, I'm a first-time candidate. Um, since, since the beginning of June, I've been out there in the neighborhoods chatting with residents, lis listening to concerns, hearing ideas. Uh, some of the top concerns that I've been hearing from residents is the, the cost of living, traffic congestion, overdevelopment, also some concerns about the lack of medical services here in the city, um, specific concerns regarding the school system, school safety, uh, vaping, and th these are all concerns that uh, <coughs> I want to um, focus on if, if elected, um, because I, I definitely want to tackle the issues that are most important to the residents. Um, if elected, I will be working for the residents and, and not the mayor, the developers, the department heads. I will tr focus on the residents as much as I can. And I will um, make myself available to you. I'll, I'll be listening to concerns. I'll hold office hours and I'll be out there in the community as much as I can. Um, community meetings, uh, meet, uh, events, neighborhoods, things of that nature. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about my background. Um, I, I've worked as a budget analyst for many years. I have a, an MBA degree from Bentley. I've been involved with uh, Quincy Community Action Programs, Quincy Climate Action Network, Quincy Pride, uh, as, uh, as War II Civic Association. Um, I humbly ask for your vote on November 5th, and if elected, it would be an honor to serve as one of your city councilors. Thank you. Held to stand up. <laughs> so I'm Joanne Sullivan. My husband's Cantor. I humbly ask for your vote on November 5th. I really didn't know I was running for counselor at large. I tried to open five good men, one good lady, and they said no for family and work and other responsibilities. But I felt time to give back to my community that when we came here for a visit in 2012, was invited to move here. Like everybody we met, I guess, to move here. In fact, um, the house that we bought in 2014, my neighbor had it for sale. He had it for sale for two years. I'm the only one he sold it to, and he lives next door. Um, it's just been one big extended family here. Um, we're not from here, but we're blessed that this is our new home. We're very involved in different circles. My son played all the sports here, from Quincy Youth Arena, <coughs> basketball, soccer, golf. Um, this, everybody's just wonderful and uh, it's time to give back and when we work together uh, good great happens here in Quincy and it's only going to get better as it's been going thus far and uh, anybody has any issues or any concerns that need to be addressed call me we'll meet write text my email is Joanne Sullivan Cantor MA at gmail.com MA from Massachusetts and Ma. And um, just, I'm here available for you. I haven't really gotten to go to Boston too often because everything is here. All the arts, culture, and the green space and the parks. And I hope to get a new cardio heart health park for adults. It's needed to exercise. Thank you.
So again, thank you to this beautiful panel of candidates. How lucky are we as a city to have all of you folks as our options? Everyone, please go vote on November 5th. And to the steering committee of March Forward, Quincy, thank you so much for ensuring that this evening was possible and a success. We will